Thank you, Carol and Chris, and thank you to Child Trends for inviting me to be here. I would like to start off by saying that the views I will be expressing during this presentation are my own and do not express the views of the Library of Congress or the Congressional Research Service. What I'll be discussing, as Chris mentioned, is the context for fiscal reform, the common themes between various deficit reduction proposals, and why implementing this reform has been so difficult. First, I want to start off with a picture of why we need to do something about our fiscal situation. As the Congressional Budget Office projects, under current policies, around the middle of the next decade, so roughly in 10 years from now, tax collections in the U.S. will only be enough to cover spending on interest, Social Security, and federal health programs. By 2050, under certain assumptions, every dollar that the U.S. collects will go towards paying interest on the federal debt only. And what that means is that everything else we want to spend money on will have to be borrowed. There are a variety of different groups that have submitted or presented deficit reduction policies. The five that I show here are sort of the ones that are most commonly talked about um, in terms of their bipartisanship. Obviously, there's a wide variation in the recommendations of each group, and I'm sort of using this chart as just to show kind of the basics that each group talks about. Everyone agrees that you cannot fix the problem by cutting spending or raising revenue alone. A mix of both is needed. Each plan recommends major changes to entitlement programs, tax reform, and limits on discretionary or appropriated annual spending. In most cases, the majority of the deficit reduction dollars come from tax reform and entitlement reform. Under each of these plans, as projected by these groups, by 2020, they will reduce the budget deficit to about 1 to 2 percent of gross domestic product, or 1 to 2 percent of the economy. This is a drastic reduction from what we see today, which is about 8 percent of gross domestic product. By 2020, also, they estimate that the debt to gross domestic product, or GDP ratio, will be about 60 percent. A lot of times you may have heard people saying things like, this plan saves more money than that one and therefore it's better, or this plan is just generally better than that one for a variety of reasons. But it's really hard to know because there are a lot of gaps in what these commissions and other groups have proposed. There was no legislative language and they were also not scored by a common entity such as the Congressional Budget Office or calculations of their deficit reduction amounts were not made on a common baseline which is important to keep in mind when trying to compare these proposals. However, some of these, some examples of the policy recommendations include broadening the tax base, lowering tax rates, eliminating tax expenditures via reform of the tax code, limiting growth in federal health care spending by raising the Medicare eligibility age, curbing costs, and increasing cost sharing for higher beneficiary, for higher income beneficiaries. Reforming Social Security by changing benefits, increasing payroll taxes, and increasing the retirement age. And finally, they also do recommend reprioritizing spending towards more growth-oriented investments while reducing spending on other defense and non-defense programs. So given all these common themes, it seems an obvious question would be, well, why is it so hard for Congress to enact any of these plans? And that's when you get into some of the more overarching issues that Congress and the President need to consider, such as how large should the government be? Historically, that's been about 21 percent of the economy. Federal spending's been about 21 percent. But given the growth in the major entitlement programs, that spending is projected to rise dramatically. Making changes to the spending path or revenue pass will have economic, social, and generational effects, and that will be burdensome to everyone. So because Congress is a legislative body and it typically enacts legislation in a more piecemeal fashion, there are hundreds of players and dozens of procedural and legislative hurdles that need to be overcome. They have to overcome political considerations in order to craft a plan that will be workable to balance power dynamics, please stakeholders, and finally reach an agreement that will generate enough, enough votes to pass a deficit reduction plan. On top of these longer-term considerations, we have more immediate concerns, which everyone has probably heard over and over again, 
um, called the fiscal cliff. Um, the largest of these considerations is whether or not to allow all or some of the Bush tax cuts to expire. In addition, roughly half of the deficit reduction enacted as part of the Budget Control Act is set to take effect beginning in January. There's been a lot of talk about replacing it, but who knows what they're going to replace it with. Or if you eliminate it, you have to get that deficit reduction from somewhere else. Other things to consider are the expiration of certain stimulus policies related to, temporary, to the temporary employee payroll tax rate reduction and extended unemployment benefits. And finally, Congress still has to tackle its annual issues, which include funding for the government for the second half of the fiscal year, the debt limit, which I'm not too excited about reliving, and other annual tax-related legislation. This effectively limits the time that Congress has to work on issues related to longer-term deficit reduction. And the longer they wait, the more costly that reform will be. Um, the fiscal problems are real, and everyone knows that a solution, which some estimate could be in the area of $4 trillion over 10 years, is needed to stabilize the U.S. fiscal outlook. It is likely that everyone will have to sacrifice. How those sacrifices could impact children will be addressed in more detail by the next two speakers. 